So this ties in with an article uh, it's in the paper today. They're always uh, they're always looking at statistics and. And I actually wonder about even statistics. Why certain studies that they do every five or ten years? Well, they do these studies on the same topics to see if the agenda is working. That's why it's done, you see. And this article here is from uh, the Associated Press. And it says, uh, is marriage becoming obsolete? I've seen these articles my whole life long as they did their checks to see if, if their agenda was working. It says, as families gather for Thanksgiving this year, nearly one in three American children is living with a parent who is divorced, separated, or never married. More parents are accepting the view that wedding bells aren't needed to have a family. A study by Pew Research Center in association with Time magazine highlights rapidly changing notions of the American family. And the Census Bureau, too, is planning to incorporate broader definitions of family when measuring poverty a shift caused partly by recent jumps in unmarried couples living together. It says about 29% of children under 18 now live with a parent or parents who are unwed or no longer married, a five-fold increase from 1960, according to the Pew report being released Thursday. Broken down further, about 15% of parents who are divorced or separated and 14% who are never married. Within those two groups, a sizable chunk about 6% have parents who are live-in couples who opted to raise children together without getting married. Indeed, about 39% of Americans said marriage was becoming obsolete and that sentiment that follows U.S. Census data released in September showed that marriages hit an all-time low of 52% of adults 18 and over. Uh, then they go into... Um, it says, uh, when it asks what constitutes a family, see, they're, they're redefining it all the time. As you well know, if you watch the comedy shows, that's how they always introduce the new things through comedy, which otherwise you'd be, you wouldn't get a laugh at, it'd be too serious if it didn't. Uh, it says, when asked what constitutes a family, a vast majority of Americans agree that a married couple with or without children fits that description, but four or five surveyed pointed also to an unmarried opposite-sex couple with children or a single parent. Three out of five said a same-sex couple with children was a family because they watch TV a lot. Marriage is still very important in this country, but it doesn't dominate family life like it used to, said Andrew Cherlin, professor of sociology and public policy at John Hopkins University. Very interesting that, you see, because sociologists and ethnologists and and, and anthropologists all worked with the big boys to bring in the modern culture, and they were working heavily on this uh, from, I'd say, about the 1940s onwards to bring in like, this kind of society. Interesting how it's worked. And it says, The broadening views of family are expected to have an impact at Thanksgiving. About 9 in 10 Americans say they will share a Thanksgiving meal next week with family, sitting at a table with 12 people on average, but one-fourth of respondents said there will be 20 or more family members. And, and you know, that it's, it's worse for other countries in Europe, like Britain. It's just devastated, destroyed, because of the massive welfare states allowed, actually encouraged uh, women just to have children on their own without having men at all. Uh, and you'd, you'd need a man to get into, get impregnated today. They've got all these clinics that'll do it all for you. And then the rest of the society just picks up the tab and keeps them living in their homes. So this was all arranged. Then you go back to the Communist Manifesto. And on on this page here, it's page 100, it says here, one of the planks is abolition of the family. Even the most radical uh, flare up at this infamous proposal of the communists. On what foundation is the present family, the bourgeois family based, the middle class are talking about? On capital, on private gain, in its completely developed form, this family exists only amongst the middle class, the bourgeoisie. But this state of things finds its complement in the practical absence of the family amongst the proletarians and in public prostitution. The bourgeois family will vanish as a matter of course when its complement vanishes, and both will vanish with the vanishing of capital. And technically it's all happens. Uh, do you charge us with wanting to stop the exploitation of children by their parents? To this crime we plead guilty. But will you say we destroy the most hallowed of relations when we replace home education by social education? And your education, is it not also social and determined by social conditions under which you educate by the intervention of direct or indirect of society, by means of schools, etc.? 
Communists have not invented the intervention of society in education. They do but seek to alter the character of that intervention and to rescue education from the influence of the ruling class. It says the bourgeois claptrap about the family and education, about the hallowed correlation of parent and child, becomes all the more disgusting, the more by the action of modern industry. All family ties amongst the proletarians are torn asunder and their children transformed into simple articles of commerce and instruments of labor. Technically, that was true. I mean, you had a massive underclass working in factories going through the Industrial Revolution, and uh, they were living in squalor and, and utter poverty, and all the children had to go to work as well. But, of course, they always use what is evident in uh, the time to bring in their, their utopia so the, the small uh, clink uh, elite who are mainly related to each other can rule over the rest. He says, but you communists would introduce community of women. See, that's what they want. Plato, remember, community of women, all women held in common, all available. That's what you have when you promise promiscuity. They don't think of it that way, but that's what you actually have when you stand outside and see it. So he says, uh, we didn't introduce the community of women, screams the whole bourgeois in chorus. The bourgeois sees in his wife a mere instrument of production. He hears that the instruments of production are to be exploited in common and naturally can come to no other conclusion than the lot of being common to all will likewise fall to the women. He has not even a suspicion that the real point aimed at is to do away with the status of women as mere instruments of production. That's what I actually wonder about when you see the women in Russia with the picks and as they were digging up the roads, you know, helping the, the system. For the rest, nothing is more ridiculous than the virtuous indignation of our middle class at the community of women, which they pretend is to be openly officially established by the communists. The communists have no need to introduce co- a community of women. It has existed almost from time immemorial. It may have been in the lands that these, this guy actually came from and his, with his predecessors, who knows. But anyway, that's... Um, that's is, as I say, was part of their plank of the Communist Manifesto, destruction of the family unit. And, uh, and then they would have their planned society. Again, they also wanted to decide who would breed and who would not breed too, if they could bring it into full production that way, their whole um, plan and agenda. But as I say, in the West, they had to use a different tactic. And the tailor made them slightly different from each other, from Britain to the U.S. and so on, according to the present cultures that they had. Now, remember, Carl Quigley was the historian uh, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and Carl Quigley was all for whatever they did. Now, remember, the Council on Foreign Relations works with its its daddy uh, uh, in Britain, which is the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Remember, it's the Royal Institute for International Affairs. If you're all thinking it's just like another communist organization, it's got a royal charter to exist. It's above government, you might say. And it says here in, in uh, Tragedy and Hope, on page 1263, it says... Um, Behind this protective barrier, uh, barrier, a new teenage culture has grown up. This is in the 60s he's talking about. Its chief characteristic is rejection of parental values and of middle class culture. What a coincidence, eh? It's all coincidences we're reading here. In many ways, this new culture was like that of the African tribes. It tastes, it tastes in music and the dance, its emphasis on sex play its increasingly scanty clothing, its emphasis on group solidarity, the high value it puts on interpersonal relations, especially talking and social drinking, and drug taking, I should add to it. It's it's almost total rejection of future preference and constant efforts to free itself. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, we're back, cutting through the matrix, just tying a few things together to show people that nothing happens by itself. Nothing in any major scale happens by itself. It takes coordination of various sciences. Uh, it, it takes cooperation definitely of big academia. It takes cooperation between the entertainment industry and uh, popular television and so on, all to all work together to cause cultural changes in society. And, uh, and we're influenced more by fiction than we are by anything else, believe it or not. Fiction really, uh, it's like monkey see, monkey do. Plato said the same thing about drama on the stage in ancient Greece. 
So it says here, here's Carl Quigley talking about, uh, and remember, he was for this agenda, he worked for this agenda, and he was a professor himself, and he thought it was just swell that it seemed to be going to plan. And he, he's talking about how the children uh, suddenly, and it was a sudden thing, uh, how they rejected uh, uh, the old values suddenly, because it was a trendy thing to do, obviously, and they were copying the culture like that of the African tribes. Now I can remember reading about ways that the communists could possibly do this, and they were going into things like dance. And if they could break all the old traditional dances, which actually required you to hold the partner, no kidding, that's how it used to be. Amazing, eh? Used to hold the person, since that was the whole point of it. And um, and then suddenly they're dancing apart, staring at each other's knees. But so they brought that in very successfully, and but they, they copied it from from African dancing, basically. And they also used the beat as well to try and bring on the sexual stimulation of the African uh, tribal dances as well. And so they used, as I say, anthropologists big time in the culture industry at this particular period. Getting back to the book, though, it says here, uh, they started to put dressing um, in scantily, uh, scanty clothing, the heavy exercise on sex play, Emphasis on group solidarity. We're all together. We're a different species from the from the old species. Basically, that's what they thought, you know. And they're told by the communists in America, don't trust trust anybody over 30. So don't listen to them. In fact, over 30. And then it says here, and the high value it puts on interpersonal relations, especially uh, talking and social drinking. It's almost total rejection of future preference and its constant efforts to free itself from the tyranny of time. Uh, they were always stones, so they could never turn up for anything. Teenage solidarity and sociality, uh, and sociality, especially the solidarity of their groups and subgroups are amazingly African in attitudes as they gather at nightly or at least uh, on weekends to drink, uh, cokes, uh, talk, uh, intermingle, uh, inter- interminably in the midst of throbbing music preferably in semi-darkness with couples drifting off for sex play in the corners as a kind of social diversion and a complete emancipation from time. Usually they have their own language. Uh, that was all given to them too. They didn't know that, of course. With vocabulary and constructions so strange that parents find them almost incomprehensible. This Africanization of American society is gradually spreading with the passing years to higher age levels in our culture and is having profound and damaging effects on the transfer of middle class values to the rising generation. A myriad um, of symbolic acts over the last 20 years have served to demonstrate the solidarity of teen culture and its rejection of middle class values. Many of these involve dress and dating customs both major issues in the adolescent parental cold war. Interesting term, eh? Adolescent parental cold war. The jive language of the period also had a South Chicago origin and has been traced back to a large extent to a saloon run by a certain local uh, oracle called HIP early in the 20th century. Fortunately, going steady was only a brief if drastic challenge to potential attitudes and was soon replaced by tribal gregariousness and tolerant sexual broad-mindedness, which might be called clique-going, since it evolved social solidarity, sometimes sexual promiscuity, within a small group, usually of ten or less. This became, to their adults, the teenage gang, which still strives uh, or thrives, but never in a very formal way in middle-class circles, as it does in lower-class ones. Two casualties of this process are sexual jealousy and sexual privacy, both of which have largely disappeared amongst many upper middle class young people. Now that's what the communists said too, the Dewey with jealousy and so on, and you'd have no steady partner. Back with more after this. (laughs) 